fooled into the attempt to hook a husband. Never mind. Well-meaning women have their own consciences to comfort them after all. Do not, therefore, be too much afraid of showing yourself as you are, affectionate and good-hearted. Do not too harshly repress sentiments and feelings excellent in themselves, because you fear that some puppy may fancy that you are letting them come out to fascinate him. Do not condemn yourself to live only by halves, because if you showed too much animation some pragmatical thing in breeches might take it into his pate to imagine that you designed to dedicate your life to his inanity. Still, a composed, decent, equable deportment is a capital treasure to a woman, and that you possess. Write again soon for I feel rather fierce, and want stroking down. June 13, 1845 As to the Mrs. Dash Dash, who, you say, is like me, I somehow feel no leaning to her at all. I never do to people who are said to be like me, because I have always a notion that they are only like me in the disagreeable, outside first acquaintance part of my character, in those points which are obvious to the ordinary run of people, and which I know are not pleasing. You say she is clever, a clever person. How I dislike the term. It means rather a shrewd, very ugly, meddling, talking woman. I feel reluctant to leave Papa for a single day. His sight diminishes weakly, and can it be wondered at that, as he sees the most precious of his faculties leaving him, his spirits sometimes sink. It is so hard to feel that his few and scanty pleasures must all soon go. He has now the greatest difficulty in either reading or writing and then he dreads the state of dependence to which blindness will inevitably reduce him. He fears that he will be nothing in his parish. I try to cheer him, sometimes I succeed temporarily, but no consolation can restore his sight, or atone for the want of it. Still he is never peevish, never impatient only anxious and dejected. For the reason just given, Charlotte declined an invitation to the only house to which she was now ever asked to come. In answer to her correspondent's reply to this letter, she says, You thought I refused you coldly, did you? It was a queer sort of coldness, when I would have given my ears to say yes and was obliged to say no. Matters, however, are now a little changed. Anne is come home, and her presence certainly makes me feel more at liberty. Then, if all be well, I will come and see you. Tell me only when I must come. Mention the week and the day. Have the kindness also to answer the following queries, if you can. How far is it from Leeds to Sheffield? Can you give me a notion of the cost? Of course, when I come, you will let me enjoy your own company in peace, and not drag me out of visiting. I have no desire at all to see your curate. I think he must be like all the other curates I have seen, and they seem to me a self-seeking, vain, empty race. At this blessed moment, we have no less than three of them in Hayworth Parish, and there is not one to mend another. The other day, they all three, accompanied by Mr. S., dropped, or rather rushed, in unexpectedly to tea. It was Monday, baking day, and I was hot and tired, still, 
if they had behaved quietly and decently, I would have served them out their tea in peace, but they began glorifying themselves, and abusing dissenters in such a manner, that my temper lost its balance, and I pronounced a few sentences sharply and rapidly, which struck them all dumb. Papa was greatly horrified also, but I don't regret it. On her return from this short visit to her friend, she travelled with a gentleman in the railway carriage, whose features and bearing betrayed him, in a moment, to be a Frenchman. She ventured to ask him if such was not the case, and, on his admitting it, she further inquired if he had not passed a considerable time in Germany, and was answered that he had. Her quick ear detected something of the thick guttural pronunciation, which, Frenchmen say, they are able to discover even in the grandchildren of their countrymen who have lived any time beyond the Rhine. Charlotte had retained her skill in the language by the habit of which she thus speaks to M. Heger, J. E. Crane's Boku d'Oublia le Francaise. J. Apprentis les jours en demi page de Francaise par Coya, it J. R. E. Grand Plaisir et Apprendre cette lecon, vous les présenter à Madame et l'assurance de mon estime, J. E. Cranes Q. Maria Louise et Claire N. E. M. A. Int déjà oublies, mais J. E. vous reverrez ou enjeu. Ossetot Q. J. Or A. Skagnas A. D. Argent pour Alter A. Brucels. J. Y. R. I. And so her journey back to Hayworth, after the rare pleasure of this visit to her friend, was pleasantly beguiled by conversation with the French gentleman, and she arrived at home refreshed and happy. What to find there? It was ten o'clock when she reached the parsonage. Branwell was there, unexpectedly, very ill. He had come home a day or two before, apparently for a holiday, in reality, I imagine, because some discovery had been made which rendered his absence imperatively desirable. The day of Charlotte's return, he had received a letter from Mr. Dash Dash, sternly dismissing him, intimating that his proceedings were discovered characterizing them as bad beyond expression, and charging him, on pain of exposure, to break off immediately, and forever, all communication with every member of the family. Whatever may have been the nature and depth of Branwell's sins, whatever may have been his temptation, whatever his guilt, there is no doubt of the suffering which his conduct entailed upon his poor father and his innocent sisters. The hopes and plans they had cherished long, and labored hard to fulfill, were cruelly frustrated, henceforward their days were embittered and the natural rest of their nights destroyed by his paroxysms of remorse. Let us read of the misery caused to his poor sisters in Charlotte's own affecting words, We have had sad work with Branwell. He thought of nothing but stunning or drowning his agony of mind. No one in this house could have rest, and, at last, we have been obliged to send him from home for a week, with someone to look after him. He has written to me this morning, expressing some sense of contrition but as long as he remains at home, I scarce dare hope for peace in the house. We must all, I fear, prepare for a season of distress and disquietude. When I left you, I was strongly impressed with the feeling that I was going back to sorrow. August 1845. Things here at home are much as usual, not very bright as it regards Branwell, though his health, 
and consequently his temper, have been somewhat better this last day or two, because he is now forced to abstain. August 18, 1845 I have delayed writing, because I have no good news to communicate. My hopes are blow indeed about Branwell. I sometimes fear he will never be fit for much. The late blow to his prospects and feelings has quite made him reckless. It is only absolute want of means that acts as any check to him. One ought, indeed, to hope to the very last, and I try to do so, but occasionally hope in his case seems so fallacious. November 4, 1845 I hoped to be able to ask you to come to Hayworth. It almost seemed as if Branwell had a chance of getting employment, and I waited to know the result of his efforts in order to say, Dear Dash Dash, come and see us. But the place, a secretaryship to a railway committee, is given to another person. Branwell still remains at home, and while he is here, you shall not come. I am more confirmed in that resolution the more I see of him. I wish I could say one word to you in his favour, but I cannot. I will hold my tongue. We are all obliged to you for your kind suggestion about Leeds, but I think our school schemes are, for the present, at rest. December 31, 1845 You say well, in speaking of Dash Dash, that no sufferings are so awful as those brought on by dissipation, alas! I see the truth of this observation daily proved, and, must have as weary and burdensome a life of it in waiting upon their unhappy brother. It seems grievous, indeed, that those who have not sinned should suffer so largely. In fact, all their latter days blighted with the presence of cruel, shameful suffering, the premature deaths of two at least of the sisters, all the great possibilities of their earthly lives snapped short, may be dated from midsummer 1845. For the last three years of Branwell's life, he took opium habitually, by way of stunning conscience, he drank moreover, whenever he could get the opportunity. The reader may say that I have mentioned his tendency to intemperance long before. It is true, but it did not become habitual, as far as I can learn, until after he was dismissed from his tutorship. He took opium, because it made him forget for a time more effectually than drink, and, besides, it was more portable. In procuring it he showed all the cunning of the opium eater. He would steal out while the family were at church, to which he had professed himself too ill to go, and managed to cajole the village druggist out of a lump, or, it might be, the carrier had unsuspiciously brought him some in a packet from a distance. For some time before his death he had attacks of delirium tremens of the most frightful character, he slept in his father's room, and he would sometimes declare that either he or his father should be dead before the morning. The trembling sisters, sick with fright, would implore their father not to expose himself to this danger, but Mr. Bronte is no timid man and perhaps he felt that he could possibly influence his son to some self-restraint, more by showing trust in him than by showing fear. The sisters often listened for the report of a pistol in the dead of the night, 
till watchful eye and hearkening ear grew heavy and dull with the perpetual strain upon their nerves. In the mornings young Bronte would saunter out, saying, with a drunkard's incontinence of speech, The poor old man and I have had a terrible night of it, he does his best, the poor old man, but it's all over with me. Chapter 14 In the course of this sad autumn of 1845, a new interest came up, faint, indeed, and often lost sight of in the vivid pain and constant pressure of anxiety respecting their brother. In the biographical notice of her sisters, which Charlotte prefixed to the edition of Wuthering Heights and Agnes Gray published in 1850, a piece of writing unique, as far as I know, in its pathos and its power, she says, One day in the autumn of 1845, I accidentally lighted on a MS volume of verse, in my sister Emily's handwriting. Of course, I was not surprised, knowing that she could and did write verse, I looked it over and something more than surprise seized me, a deep conviction that these were not common effusions, nor at all like the poetry women generally write. I thought them condensed and terse, vigorous and genuine. To my ear they had also a peculiar music, wild, melancholy, and elevating. My sister Emily was not a person of demonstrative character, nor one on the recesses of whose mind and feelings even those nearest and dearest to her could, with impunity, intrude unlicensed, it took hours to reconcile her to the discovery I had made, and days to persuade her that such poems merited publication. Meantime, my younger sister quietly produced some of her own compositions, intimating that since Emily's had given me pleasure, I might like to look at hers. I could not but be a partial judge, yet I thought that these verses too had a sweet sincere pathos of their own. We had very early cherished the dream of one day being authors. We agreed to arrange a small selection of our poems, and, if possible, get them printed. Averse to personal publicity, we veiled our own names under those of Kerr, Ellis, and Acton Bell, the ambiguous choice being dictated by a sort of conscientious scruple at assuming Christian names, positively masculine while we did not like to declare ourselves women, because, without at the time suspecting that our mode of writing and thinking was not what is called feminine we had a vague impression that authoresses are liable to be looked on with prejudice, we noticed how critics sometimes use for their chastisement the weapon of personality, and for their reward, a flattery which is not true praise. The bringing out of our little book was hard work. As was to be expected, neither we nor our poems were at all wanted, but for this we had been prepared at the outset, though inexperienced ourselves, we had read the experience of others. The great puzzle lay in the difficulty of getting answers of any kind from the publishers to whom we applied. Being greatly harassed by this obstacle, I ventured to apply to the Messrs. Chambers, of Edinburgh, for a word of advice. They may have forgotten the circumstance, but I have not, for from them I received a brief and businesslike but civil and sensible reply, on which we acted, and at last made way. I inquired from Mr. Robert Chambers, and found, as Miss Bronte conjectured, that he had entirely forgotten the application which had been made to him and his brother for advice, 
nor had they any copy or memorandum of the correspondence. There is an intelligent man living in Hayworth, who has given me some interesting particulars relating to the sisters about this period. He says, I have known Miss Bronte, as Miss Bronte, a long time, indeed, ever since they came to Hayworth in 1819. But I had not much acquaintance with the family till about 1843, when I began to do a little in the stationary line. Nothing of that kind could be had nearer than Keeley before I began. They used to buy a great deal of writing paper, and I used to wonder whatever they did with so much. I sometimes thought they contributed to the magazines. When I was out of stock, I was always afraid of their coming, they seemed so distressed about it, if I had none. I have walked to Halifax, a distance of ten miles many a time, for half a ream of paper, for fear of being without it when they came. I could not buy more at a time for want of capital. I was always short of that. I did so like them to come when I had anything for them, they were so much different to anybody else, so gentle and kind, and so very quiet. They never talked much. Charlotte sometimes would sit and inquire about our circumstances so kindly and feelingly. Though I am a poor working man, which I have never felt to be any degradation, I could talk with her with the greatest freedom. I always felt quite at home with her. Though I never had any school education, I never felt the want of it in her company. The publishers to whom she finally made a successful application for the production of Kerr, Ellis, and Acton Bell's poems were Messrs. Aylott and Jones, Patton Ostero. Mr. Aylott has kindly placed the letters which she wrote to them on the subject at my disposal. The first is dated the 28th of January, 1846, and in it she inquires if they will publish one volume octavo of poems, if not at their own risk, on the author's account. It is signed C. Bronte. They must have replied pretty speedily, for on the 31st of January she writes again, Gentlemen. Since you agree to undertake the publication of the work respecting which I applied to you, I should wish now to know, as soon as possible, the cost of paper and printing. I will then send the necessary remittance, together with the manuscript. I should like it to be printed in one octavo volume of the same quality of paper and size of type as Moxon's last edition of Wordsworth. The poems will occupy, I should think, from 200 to 250 pages. They are not the production of a clergyman, nor are they exclusively of a religious character, but I presume these circumstances will be immaterial. It will, perhaps, be necessary that you should see the manuscript, in order to calculate accurately the expense of publication, in that case I will send it immediately. I should like, however, previously, to have some idea of the probable cost, and if, from what I have said, you can make a rough calculation on the subject. I should be greatly obliged to you. In her next letter, the 6th of February, she says, you will perceive that the poems are the work of three persons, relatives, their separate pieces are distinguished by their respective signatures. 
she writes again on the 15th of February, and on the 16th she says, the MS will certainly form a thinner volume than I had anticipated. I cannot name another model which I should like it precisely to resemble, yet, I think, a duodsimo form, and a somewhat reduced, though still clear type, would be preferable. I only stipulate for clear type, not too small, and good paper. On the 21st of February she selects the long primer type for the poems, and will remit 31L. 10S in a few days. Minute as the details conveyed in these notes are, they are not trivial because they afford such strong indications of character. If the volume was to be published at their own risk, it was necessary that the sister conducting the negotiation should make herself acquainted with the different kinds of type, and the various sizes of books. Accordingly she bought a small volume from which to learn all she could on the subject of preparation for the press. No half-knowledge, no trusting to other people for decisions which she could make for herself, and yet a generous and full confidence, not misplaced, in the thorough property of Messrs. Aylert and Jones. The caution in ascertaining the risk before embarking in the enterprise and the prompt payment of the money required, even before it could be said to have assumed the shape of a debt, were both parts of a self-reliant and independent character. Self-contained also was she. During the whole time that the volume of poems was in the course of preparation and publication, no word was written telling anyone, out of the household circle what was in progress. I have had some of the letters placed in my hands, which she addressed to her old school mistress, Miss W. They begin a little before this time. Acting on the conviction, which I have all along entertained, that where Charlotte Bronte's own words could be used, no others ought to take their place. I shall make extracts from this series, according to their dates. January 30, 1846 My dear Miss W, I have not yet paid my visit to, it is, indeed, more than a year since I was there, but I frequently hear from me, and she did not fail to tell me that you were gone into Worcestershire, she was unable however, to give me your exact address. Had I known it, I should have written to you long since. I thought you would wonder how we were getting on, when you heard of the railway panic, and you may be sure that I am very glad to be able to answer your kind inquiries by the assurance that our small capital is as yet undiminished. The York and Midland is, as you say, a very good line, yet, I confess to you, I should wish, for my own part, to be wise in time. I cannot think that even the very best lines will continue for many years at their present premiums, and I have been most anxious for us to sell our shares ere it be too late, and to secure the proceeds in some safer if, for the present, less profitable investment. I cannot, however, persuade my sisters to regard the affair precisely from my point of view, and I feel as if I would rather run the risk of loss than hurt Emily's feelings by acting in direct opposition to her opinion. She managed in a most handsome and able manner for me when I was in Brussels, and prevented by distance from looking after my own interests, therefore, I will let her manage still, and take the consequences. 
disinterested and energetic she certainly is, and if she be not quite so tractable or open to conviction as I could wish, I must remember perfection is not the lot of humanity, and as long as we can regard those we love, and to whom we are closely allied, with profound and never shaken esteem, it is a small thing that they should vex us occasionally by what appear to us unreasonable and headstrong notions. You, my dear Miss W, know, full as well as I do, the value of sisters' affection to each other. There is nothing like it in this world, I believe, when they are nearly equal in age, and similar in education, tastes, and sentiments. You ask about Branwell, he never thinks of seeking employment, and I begin to fear that he has rendered himself incapable of filling any respectable station in life. Besides, if money were at his disposal, he would use it only to his own injury. The faculty of self-government is, I fear, almost destroyed in him. You ask me if I do not think that men are strange beings. I do, indeed. I have often thought so, and I think, too, that the mode of bringing them up is strange. They are not sufficiently guarded from temptation. Girls are protected as if they were something very frail or silly indeed, while boys are turned loose on the world as if they, of all beings in existence, were the wisest and least liable to be led astray. I am glad you like Broomsgrove, though, I dare say, there are few places you would not like, with Mrs. M for a companion. I always feel a peculiar satisfaction when I hear of your enjoying yourself because it proves that there really is such a thing as retributive justice even in this world. You worked hard, you denied yourself all pleasure, almost all relaxation, in your youth, and in the prime of life, now you are free, and that while you have still, I hope, many years of vigor and health in which you can enjoy freedom. Besides, I have another and very egotistical motive for being pleased, it seems that even a lone woman can be happy, as well as cherished wives and proud mothers. I am glad of that. I speculate much on the existence of unmarried and never to be married women nowadays and I have already got to the point of considering that there is no more respectable character on this earth than an unmarried woman, who makes her own way through life quietly, perseveringly, without support of husband or brother, and who, having attained the age of forty-five or upwards, retains in her possession a well-regulated mind a disposition to enjoy simple pleasures, and fortitude to support. Inevitably pains, sympathy with the sufferings of others, and willingness to relieve want as far as her means extend. During the time that the negotiation with Messrs. Aylert and Company was going on, Charlotte went to visit her old school friend with whom she was in such habits of confidential intimacy, but neither then nor afterwards, did she ever speak to her of the publication of the poems, nevertheless, this young lady suspected that the sisters wrote for magazines, and in this idea she was confirmed when, on one of her visits to Hayworth, she saw Anne with a number of Chambers's journal and a gentle smile. Of pleasure stealing over her placid face as she read. What is the matter? asked the friend. Why do you smile? Only because I see they have inserted one of my poems was the quiet reply, and not a word more was said on the subject. 
To this friend Charlotte addressed the following letters, March 3, 1846. I reached home a little after two o'clock, all safe and right yesterday, I found Papa very well, his sight much the same. Emily and Anne were going to Keeley to meet me, unfortunately, I had returned by the old road, while they were gone by the new, and we missed each other. They did not get home till half past four, and were caught in the heavy shower of rain which fell in the afternoon. I am sorry to say Anne has taken a little cold in consequence, but I hope she will soon be well. Papa was much cheered by my report of Mr. C.S. opinion, and of old Mrs. E.S. experience but I could perceive he caught gladly at the idea of deferring the operation a few months longer. I went into the room where Branwell was, to speak to him, about an hour after I got home, it was very forced work to address him. I might have spared myself the trouble, as he took no notice, and made no reply, he was stupefied. My fears were not in vain. I hear that he got a sovereign while I have been away, under pretense of paying a pressing debt, he went immediately and changed it at a public house, and has employed it as was to be expected. Dash concluded her account by saying he was a hopeless being, it is too true. In his present state it is scarcely possible to stay in the room where he is. What the future has in store I do not know. March 31, 1846 Our poor old servant Tabby had a sort of fit, a fortnight since, but is nearly recovered now. Martha, the girl they had to assist poor old Tabby, and who remains still the faithful servant at the parsonage, is ill with a swelling in her knee, and obliged to go home. I fear it will be long before she is in working condition again. I received the number of the record you sent. I read D. Orbignes letter. It is clever, and in what he says about Catholicism very good. The Evangelical Alliance part is not very practicable, yet certainly it is more in accordance with the spirit of the Gospel to preach unity among Christians than to inculcate mutual intolerance and hatred. I am very glad I went to, when I did, for the changed weather has somewhat changed my health and strength since. How do you get on? I long for mild south and west winds. I am thankful Papa continues pretty well, though often made very miserable by Branwell's wretched conduct. There, there is no change but for the worse. Meanwhile the printing of the volume of poems was quietly proceeding. After some consultation and deliberation, the sisters had determined to correct the proofs themselves, up to the 28th of March the publishers had addressed their correspondent as C. Bronte, Esquire, but at this time some little mistake occurred and she desired Messrs. Aylott and Company in future to direct to her real address, Miss Bronte and C. She had, however, evidently left it to be implied that she was not acting on her own behalf, but as agent for the real authors, since in a note dated the 6th of April, she makes a proposal on behalf of C, E, and a bell which is to the following effect, that they are preparing for the press a work of fiction, consisting of three distinct and unconnected tales which may be published either together, as a work of three volumes, of the ordinary novel size, 
or separately, as single volumes, as may be deemed most advisable. She states, in addition, that it is not their intention to publish these tales on their own account, but that the authors direct her to ask Messrs. Aylert and Company whether they would be disposed to undertake the work, after having, of course, by due inspection of the MS, ascertained that its contents are such as to warrant an expectation of success. To this letter of inquiry the publishers replied speedily, and the tenor of their answer may be gathered from Charlotte's, dated the 11th of April. I beg to thank you, in the name of C, E, and Abel, for your obliging offer of advice. I will avail myself of it, to request information on two or three points. It is evident that unknown authors have great difficulties to contend with, before they can succeed in bringing their works before the public. Can you give me any hint as to the way in which these difficulties are best met? For instance, in the present case, where a work of fiction is in question, in what form would a publisher be most likely to accept the MS. Dot? Whether offered as a work of three vols, or as tales which might be published in numbers, or as contributions to a periodical? What publishers would be most likely to receive favorably a proposal of this nature? Would it suffice to write to a publisher on the subject? or would it be necessary to have recourse to a personal interview? Your opinion and advice on these three points, or on any other which your experience may suggest as important, would be esteemed by us as a favour. It is evident from the whole tenor of this correspondence, that the truthfulness and property of the firm of publishers with whom she had to deal in this her first literary venture, were strongly impressed upon her mind, and was followed by the inevitable consequence of reliance on their suggestions. And the progress of the poems was not unreasonably lengthy or long drawn out. On the 20th of April she writes to desire that three copies may be sent to her, and that Messrs. Aylert will advise her as to the reviewers to whom copies ought to be sent. I give the next letter as illustrating the ideas of these girls as to what periodical reviews or notices led public opinion. The poems to be neatly done up in cloth. Have the goodness to send copies and advertisements, as early as possible, to each of the undermentioned periodicals. Colburn's New Monthly Magazine Bentley's Magazine Hood's Magazine Gerald's Shilling Magazine Blackwood's Magazine The Edinburgh Review Tate's Edinburgh Magazine The Dublin University Magazine Also to the Daily News and to the Britannia Papers If there are any other periodicals to which you have been in the habit of sending copies of works, let them be supplied also with copies. I think those I have mentioned will suffice for advertising. In compliance with this latter request, Messrs. Aylert suggest that copies and advertisements of the work should be sent to the Athenaeum Literary Gazette Critic and Times, but in her reply Miss Bronte says, that she thinks the periodicals she first mentioned will be sufficient for advertising in at present as the authors do not wish to lay out a larger sum than £2 in advertising, esteeming the success of a work dependent more on the notice it receives from periodicals than on the quantity of advertisements. 
In case of any notice of the poems appearing, whether favourable or otherwise, Messrs. Aylott and Company are requested to send her the name and number of those periodicals in which such notices appear, as otherwise, since she has not the opportunity of seeing periodicals regularly, she may miss reading the critique. Should the poems be remarked upon favourably, it is my intention to appropriate a further sum for advertisements. If, on the other hand, they should pass unnoticed or be condemned, I consider it would be quite useless to advertise, as there is nothing, either in the title of the work, or the names of the authors, to attract attention from a single individual. I suppose the little volume of poems was published some time about the end of May, 1846. It stole into life, some weeks passed over, without the mighty murmuring public discovering that three more voices were uttering their speech. And, meanwhile, the course of existence moved drearily along from day to day with the anxious sisters, who must have forgotten their sense of authorship in the vital care gnawing at their hearts. On the 17th of June, Charlotte writes, Branwell declares that he neither can nor will do anything for himself. Good situations have been offered him, for which, by a fortnight's work, he might have qualified himself, but he will do nothing except drink and make us all wretched. In the Athenaeum of the 4th of July, under the head of Poetry for the Million, came a short review of the poems of C, E, and Abel. The reviewer assigns to Ellis the highest rank of the three brothers as he supposes them to be, he calls Ellis a fine, quaint spirit, and speaks of an evident power of wing that may reach heights not here attempted. Again, with some degree of penetration, the reviewer says, that the poems of Ellis convey an impression of originality beyond what his contributions to these volumes embody. Kerr is placed midway between Ellis and Acton. But there is little in the review to strain out, at this distance of time, as worth preserving. Still, we can fancy with what interest it was read at Hayworth Parsonage, and how the sisters would endeavour to find out reasons for opinions, or hints for the future guidance of their talents. I call particular attention to the following letter of Charlotte's, dated the 10th of July, 1846. To whom it was written, matters not but the wholesome sense of duty in it, the sense of the supremacy of that duty which God, in placing us in families, has laid out for us, seems to deserve especial regard in these days. I see you are in a dilemma, and one of a peculiar and difficult nature. Two paths lie before you, you conscientiously wish to choose the right one even though it be the most steep, straight, and rugged, but you do not know which is the right one, you cannot decide whether duty and religion command you to go out into the cold and friendless world, and there to earn your living by governess drudgery, or whether they enjoin your continued stay with your aged mother, neglecting, for the present every prospect of independency for yourself, and putting up with daily inconvenience, sometimes even with privations. I can well imagine, that it is next to impossible for you to decide for yourself in this matter, so I will decide it for you. At least, I will tell you what is my earnest conviction on the subject. I will show you candidly how the question strikes me. 
The right path is that which necessitates the greatest sacrifice of self-interest, which implies the greatest good to others, and this path, steadily followed, will lead, I believe, in time, to prosperity and to happiness, though it may seem, at the outset, to tend quite in a contrary direction. Your mother is both old and infirm, old and infirm people have but few sources of happiness, fewer almost than the comparatively young and healthy can conceive, to deprive them of one of these is cruel. If your mother is more composed when you are with her, stay with her. If she would be unhappy in case you left her, stay with her. It will not apparently, as far as short-sighted humanity can see, be for your advantage to remain at dash dash, nor will you be praised and admired for remaining at home to comfort your mother, yet, probably, your own conscience will approve, and if it does, stay with her. I recommend you to do what I am trying to do myself. The remainder of this letter is only interesting to the reader as it conveys a peremptory disclaimer of the report that the writer was engaged to be married to her father's curate, the very same gentleman to whom, eight years afterwards, she was united, and who, probably, even now, although she was unconscious of the fact, had begun his service to her in the same tender and faithful spirit as that in which Jacob served for Rachel. Others may have noticed this, though she did not. A few more notes remain of her correspondence on behalf of the Messrs. Bell with Mr. Aylett. On the 15th of July she says, I suppose, as you have not written, no other notices have yet appeared nor has the demand for the work increased. Will you favor me with a line stating whether any, or how many copies have yet been sold? But few, I fear, for, three days later, she wrote the following, The Messrs. Bell desire me to thank you for your suggestion respecting the advertisements. They agree with you that, since the season is unfavorable, advertising had better be deferred. They are obliged to you for the information respecting the number of copies sold. On the 23rd of July she writes to the Messrs. Aylett, the Messrs. Bell would be obliged to you to post the enclosed note in London. It is an answer to the letter you forwarded which contained an application for their autographs from a person who professed to have read and admired their poems. I think I before intimated, that the Messrs. Bell are desirous for the present of remaining unknown, for which reason they prefer having the note posted in London to sending it direct, in order to avoid giving any clue to residents or identity by postmark, and see. Once more, in September, she writes, as the work has received no further notice from any periodical, I presume the demand for it has not greatly increased. In the biographical notice of her sisters, she thus speaks of the failure of the modest hopes vested in this publication. The book was printed, it is scarcely known, and all of it that merits to be known are the poems of Ellis Bell. The fixed conviction I held, and hold, of the worth of these poems, has not, indeed, received the confirmation of much favorable criticism, but I must retain it notwithstanding. Footnotes, 1. A reviewer pointed out the discrepancy between the age, 27 years, assigned, on the mural tablet, to Anne Bronte at the time of her death in 1849, 
and the alleged fact that she was born at Thornton, from which place Mr. Bronte removed on the 25th of February, 1820. I was aware of the discrepancy, but I did not think it of sufficient consequence to be rectified by an examination of the register of births. Mr. Bronte's own words, on which I grounded my statement as to the time of Anne Bronte's birth, are as follows, in Thornton, Charlotte, Patrick Branwell, Emily Jane, and Anne were born. And such of the inhabitants of Hayworth as have spoken on the subject say that all the children of Mr. and Mrs. Bronte were born before they removed to Hayworth. There is probably some mistake in the inscription on the tablet. 2. In the month of April, 1858, a neat mural tablet was erected within the communion railing of the church at Hayworth, to the memory of the deceased members of the Bronte family. The tablet is of white Carrera marble on a ground of dove-colored marble with a cornice surmounted by an ornamental pediment of chaste design. Between the brackets which support the tablet, is inscribed the sacred monogram IHS, in old English letters. In memory of Maria, wife of the Reverend P. Bronte, A.B., Minister of Hayworth, she died the 15th of September, 1821 in the thirty-ninth year of her age. Also, of Maria, their daughter, who died the 6th of May, 1825, in the twelfth year of her age. Also, of Elizabeth, their daughter, who died the 15th of June, 1825, in the eleventh year of her age. Also, of Patrick Branwell, their son, who died the 24th of September, 1848, aged 31 years. Also, of Emily Jane, their daughter, who died the 19th of December, 1848, aged 30 years. Also, of Anne, their daughter, who died the 28th of May, 1849, aged 29 years. She was buried at the old church, Scarborough. Also, of Charlotte, their daughter, wife of the Reverend B. Nichols, B.A. She died the 31st of March, 1855, in the 39th year of her age. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Cor. 1556, 57. 3. With regard to my own opinion of the present school, I can only give it as formed after what was merely a cursory and superficial inspection, as I do not believe that I was in the house above half an hour. But it was and is this, that the house at Casterton seemed thoroughly healthy and well kept, and is situated in a lovely spot, that the pupils looked bright, happy, and well, and that the lady superintendent was a most prepossessing looking person, who, on my making some inquiry as to the accomplishments taught to the pupils, said that the scheme of education was materially changed since the school had been opened. I would have inserted this testimony in the first edition, had I believed that any weight could be attached to an opinion formed on such slight and superficial grounds. 4. Jane Eyre Volume I, page 20. 5. Scott describes the sport shooting at the Pope in J as an ancient game formerly practiced with archery, but at this period, 1679, with firearms. 
This was the figure of a bird decked with party-colored feathers, so as to resemble a popinjay or parrot. It was suspended to a pole, and served for a mark at which the competitors discharged their fuses and carbines in rotation, at the distance of seventy paces. He whose ball brought down the mark held the proud title of captain of the Popinjay for the remainder of the day, and was usually escorted in triumph to the most respectable change house in the neighborhood, where the evening was closed with conviviality, conducted under his auspices, and if he was able to maintain it, at his expense. Old Mortality 6. In this Gutenberg ebook M. Heger's comments are given in, at approximately the place where they occur, dp. Asterisk 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 end of the project Gutenberg ebook The Life of Charlotte Bronte, Volume 1 asterisk 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 updated editions will replace the previous one, the old editions will be renamed. Creating the works from print editions not protected by U.S. copyright law means that no one owns a United States copyright in these works, so the Foundation, and you, can copy and distribute it in the United States without permission and without paying copyright royalties. Special Rules set forth in the general terms of use part of this license, apply to copying and distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works to protect the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept and trademark. Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark, and may not be used if you charge for an ebook except by following the terms of the trademark license, including paying royalties for use of the Project Gutenberg trademark. If you do not charge anything for copies of this ebook, complying with the trademark license is very easy. You may use this ebook for nearly any purpose such as creation of derivative works, reports, performances and research. Project Gutenberg ebooks may be modified and printed and given away. You may do practically anything in the United States with ebooks not protected by U.S. copyright law. Redistribution is subject to the trademark license, especially commercial redistribution. Start full license the full project Gutenberg license please read this before you distribute or use this work to protect the project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting the free distribution of electronic works by using or distributing this work or any other work associated in any way with the phrase project Gutenberg you agree to comply with all the terms of the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license available with this file or online at www.gutenberg.org forward slash license. Section 1 General Terms of Use and Redistributing Project Gutenberg Trademark Symbol Electronic Works 1.0 by reading or using any part of this Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work, you indicate that you have read, understand, agree to and accept all the terms of this license and intellectual property, trademark forward slash copyright, agreement. If you do not agree to abide by all the terms of this agreement, you must cease using and return or destroy all copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in your possession.
If you paid a fee for obtaining a copy of or access to a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work and you do not agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement, you may obtain a refund from the person or entity to whom you paid the fee as set forth in paragraph 1.e.8. 1.b Project Gutenberg is a registered trademark. It may only be used on or associated in any way with an electronic work by people who agree to be bound by the terms of this agreement. There are a few things that you can do with most Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works even without complying with the full terms of this agreement. See paragraph 1.c below. There are a lot of things you can do with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works if you follow the terms of this agreement and help preserve free future access to Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. See paragraph 1.e below. 1.c The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation the Foundation or PGLAF, owns a compilation copyright in the collection of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works. Nearly all the individual works in the collection are in the public domain in the United States. If an individual work is unprotected by copyright law in the United States and you are located in the United States, we do not claim a right to prevent you from copying, distributing, performing, displaying or creating derivative works based on the work as long as all references to Project Gutenberg are removed. Of course, we hope that you will support the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol mission of promoting free access to electronic works by freely sharing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works in compliance with the terms of this agreement for keeping the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol name associated with the work. You can easily comply with the terms of this agreement by keeping this work in the same format with its attached full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license when you share it without charge with others. 1.d The copyright laws of the place where you are located also govern what you can do with this work. Copyright laws in most countries are in a constant state of change. If you are outside the United States, check the laws of your country in addition to the terms of this agreement before downloading, copying, displaying, performing, distributing or creating derivative works based on this work or any other Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. The Foundation makes no representations concerning the copyright status of any work in any country other than the United States. 1.e Unless you have removed all references to Project Gutenberg, 1.e.1 The following sentence, with active links to, or other immediate access to, the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license must appear prominently whenever any copy of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, any work on which the phrase Project Gutenberg appears, or with which the phrase Project Gutenberg is associated, is accessed, displayed, performed, viewed, copied or distributed. This ebook is for the use of anyone anywhere in the United States and most other parts of the world at no cost and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. You may copy it, 
give it away or reuse it under the terms of the Project Gutenberg license included with this ebook or online at www.gutenberg.org. If you are not located in the United States, you will have to check the laws of the country where you are located before using this ebook. 1.e.2 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is derived from texts not protected by U.S. copyright law, does not contain a notice indicating that it is posted with permission of the copyright holder, the work can be copied and distributed to anyone in the United States without paying any fees or charges. If you are redistributing or providing access to a work with the phrase Project Gutenberg associated with or appearing on the work, you must comply either with the requirements of paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 or obtain permission for the use of the work and the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark as set forth in paragraphs 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.3 if an individual Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work is posted with the permission of the copyright holder, your use and distribution must comply with both paragraphs 1.e.1 through 1.e.7 and any additional terms imposed by the copyright holder. Additional terms will be linked to the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license for all works posted with the permission of the copyright holder found at the beginning of this work. 1.e.4 do not unlink or detach or remove the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license terms from this work or any files containing a part of this work or any other work associated with Project Gutenberg trademark symbol. 1.e.5 Do not copy, display, perform, distribute or redistribute this electronic work, or any part of this electronic work without prominently displaying the sentence set forth in paragraph 1.e.1 with active links or immediate access to the full terms of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. 1.e.6 You may convert to and distribute this work in any binary, compressed, marked up, non-proprietary or proprietary form including any word processing or hypertext form. However, if you provide access to or distribute copies of a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work in a format other than plain vanilla ASCII or other format used in the official version posted on the official Project Gutenberg trademark symbol website, www.gutenberg.org, you must, at no additional cost, fee or expense to the user, provide a copy, a means of exporting a copy, or a means of obtaining a copy upon request, of the work in its original plain vanilla ASCII or other form. Any alternate format must include the full Project Gutenberg trademark symbol license as specified in paragraph 1.e.1. 1.e.7 Do not charge a fee for access to, viewing, displaying, performing, copying or distributing any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works unless you comply with paragraph 1.e.8 or 1.e.9. 1.e.8 You may charge a reasonable fee for copies of or providing access to or distributing Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works provided that 
you pay a royalty fee of 20% of the gross profits you derive from the use of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works calculated using the method you already use to calculate your applicable taxes. The fee is owed to the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark but he has agreed to donate royalties under this paragraph to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. Royalty payments must be paid within 60 days following each date on which you prepare, or are legally required to prepare, your periodic tax returns. Royalty payments should be clearly marked as such and sent to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation at the address specified in Section 4, Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation. You provide a full refund of any money paid by a user who notifies you in writing, or by email within 30 days of receipt that s forward slash he does not agree to the terms of the full project Gutenberg trademark symbol license. You must require such a user to return or destroy all copies of the works possessed in a physical medium and discontinue all use of and all access to other copies of project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. You provide, in accordance with paragraph 1.f.3, a full refund of any money paid for a work or a replacement copy, if a defect in the electronic work is discovered and reported to you within 90 days of receipt of the work. You comply with all other terms of this agreement for free distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol works. 1.e.9. If you wish to charge a fee or distribute a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work or group of works on different terms than are set forth in this agreement, you must obtain permission in writing from the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the manager of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark. Contact the foundation as set forth in section 3 below. 1.f1.f.1 1 .f1 Project Gutenberg volunteers and employees expend considerable effort to identify, do copyright research on, transcribe and proofread works not protected by U.S. copyright law in creating the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection. Despite these efforts, Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, and the medium on which they may be stored, may contain defects such as, but not limited to, incomplete inaccurate or corrupt data, transcription errors, a copyright or other intellectual property infringement, a defective or damaged disk or other medium, a computer virus, or computer codes that damage or cannot be read by your equipment. 1.f.2 Limited Warranty Disclaimer of Damages except for the right of replacement or refund described in paragraph 1.f.3, the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, the owner of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol trademark, and any other party distributing a Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic work under this agreement, Disclaim all liability to you for damages, costs and expenses, including legal fees. You agree that you have no remedies for negligence, strict liability, breach of warranty or breach of contract except those provided in paragraph 1.f.3. You agree that the foundation, the trademark owner, 
and any distributor under this agreement will not be liable to you for actual, direct, indirect, consequential, punitive or incidental damages even if you give notice of the possibility of such damage. 1.f.3 Limited right of replacement or refund if you discover a defect in this electronic work within 90 days of receiving it, you can receive a refund of the money, if any, you paid for it by sending a written explanation to the person you received the work from. If you received the work on a physical medium, you must return the medium with your written explanation. The person or entity that provided you with the defective work may elect to provide a replacement copy in lieu of a refund. If you received the work electronically, the person or entity providing it to you may choose to give you a second opportunity to receive the work electronically in lieu of a refund. If the second copy is also defective, you may demand a refund in writing without further opportunities to fix the problem. 1.f.4 Except for the limited right of replacement or refund set forth in paragraph 1.f.3, this work is provided to you as is, with no other warranties of any kind, express or implied including but not limited to warranties of merchantability or fitness for any purpose. 1.f.5 Some states do not allow disclaimers of certain implied warranties or the exclusion or limitation of certain types of damages. If any disclaimer or limitation set forth in this agreement violates the law of the state applicable to this agreement, the agreement shall be interpreted to make the maximum disclaimer or limitation permitted by the applicable state law. The invalidity or unenforceability of any provision of this agreement shall not void the remaining provisions. 1.f.6 Indemnity, you agree to indemnify and hold the foundation, the trademark owner, any agent or employee of the foundation, anyone providing copies of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works in accordance with this agreement, and any volunteers associated with the production promotion and distribution of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol electronic works, harmless from all liability, costs and expenses, including legal fees, that arise directly or indirectly from any of the following which you do or cause to occur. A. Distribution of this or any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work. B alteration, modification, or additions or deletions to any Project Gutenberg trademark symbol work, and, c, any defect you cause. Section 2. Information about the mission of Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Project Gutenberg trademark symbol is synonymous with the free distribution of electronic works in formats readable by the widest variety of computers including obsolete, old, middle-aged and new computers. It exists because of the efforts of hundreds of volunteers and donations from people in all walks of life. Volunteers and financial support to provide volunteers with the assistance they need are critical to reaching Project Gutenberg trademark symbol S goals and ensuring that the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol collection will remain freely available for generations to come. In 2001, 
the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation was created to provide a secure and permanent future for Project Gutenberg trademark symbol and future generations. To learn more about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation and how your efforts and donations can help, see Sections 3 and 4 and the Foundation Information page at www.gutenberg.org. Section 3 Information about the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation The Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation is a non-profit 501c3 educational corporation organized under the laws of the state of Mississippi and granted tax-exempt status by the Internal Revenue Service. The foundation's INE or Federal Tax Identification Number is 64-6221541. Contributions to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation are tax-deductible to the full extent permitted by U.S. federal laws and your state's laws. The Foundation's business office is located at 809 North 1500 West, Salt Lake City, UT 84116, 801, 596, 1887. Email contact links and up-to-date contact information can be found at the Foundation's website and official page at www.gutenberg.org forward slash contact section 4. Information about donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation Project Gutenberg trademark symbol depends upon and cannot survive without widespread public support and donations to carry out its mission of increasing the number of public domain and licensed works that can be freely distributed in machine-readable form accessible by the widest array of equipment including outdated equipment. Many small donations, $1 to $5,000, are particularly important to maintaining tax-exempt status with the IRS. The Foundation is committed to complying with the laws regulating charities and charitable donations in all 50 states of the United States. Compliance requirements are not uniform and it takes a considerable effort, much paperwork and many fees to meet and keep up with these requirements. We do not solicit donations in locations where we have not received written confirmation of compliance. To send donations or determine the status of compliance for any particular state visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. While we cannot and do not solicit contributions from states where we have not met the solicitation requirements. We know of no prohibition against accepting unsolicited donations from donors in such states who approach us with offers to donate. International donations are gratefully accepted, but we cannot make any statements concerning tax treatment of donations received from outside the United States. U.S. laws alone swamp our small staff. Please check the Project Gutenberg web pages for current donation methods and addresses. Donations are accepted in a number of other ways including checks, online payments and credit card donations. To donate, please visit www.gutenberg.org forward slash donate. Section 5. 
general information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol Electronic Works Professor Michael S. Hart was the originator of the Project Gutenberg trademark symbol concept of a library of electronic works that could be freely shared with anyone. For 40 years, he produced and distributed Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks with only a loose network of volunteer support. Project Gutenberg trademark symbol ebooks are often created from several printed editions, all of which are confirmed as not protected by copyright in the US unless a copyright notice is included. Thus, we do not necessarily keep ebooks in compliance with any particular paper edition. Most people start at our website which has the main PG search facility, www.gutenberg.org. This website includes information about Project Gutenberg trademark symbol including how to make donations to the Project Gutenberg Literary Archive Foundation, how to help produce our new ebooks, and how to subscribe to our email newsletter to hear about new ebooks.